Okay, so look, um, this is a great thing that you're doing. And if I have any criticism of this program, it's that it's too packed, right? Six parallel sessions at every step of the way and no lunch break at an event where actually in some respects the most important thing I think is you and the networking that will happen here and it makes me want to vomit inside just speaking the word networking but it's true um, is the most important thing and you know I, 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 I wish there were six days like this but you are busy people um, and I hope that there will be hundreds and hundreds more like it in the future. I wanted to talk very briefly, very quickly, about um, what I think can be achieved, not necessarily today, but in the course of perhaps a decade, perhaps two, maybe a generation or three um, in the teaching profession. And it's a really boring slide, right? This is just um, teachers and researchers working more closely together to find out what works and to do it. And that is an incredibly important thing. And it doesn't come naturally. It requires that you have structures and systems. It requires that you have a kind of information architecture to facilitate evidence-based practice. So you can see now that the jokes are all over, and it's my job to make everybody else who's speaking today look charismatic and witty by talking through this very boring slide <laughs> here. Um, and this is uh, like the sort of, it looks like the, the ramblings of a sort of deranged stoner, but this is my vision. <laughs> This is, I think, a rough sketch of what a coherent information architecture for evidence-based practice looks like. And there is nothing clever or weird or extraordinary about any of this. But it does, I think, represent like a useful kind of talking point. So look, hang on, wait. Researchers and teachers, so this is evidence-based practice teaching, okay? Teaching for teachers. And that can be in initial teacher training. It could be in CBT, in the inset days. But what's really important is and you will be constantly distracted in your working lives. These are the kinds of data sets that are available. This is the kind of work you can do. These are the shortcomings of that kind of research. And then this is a randomized controlled trial. They're done a lot in other parts of the world. They're not done so much in the UK. These are the strengths and weaknesses. This is how to spot a good randomized trial. This is when there are challenges. Sometimes randomized trials are done in one population, in, a, in a, perhaps something that works in a rural population that is very ethnically diverse, may not work so well in an urban population that is entirely white and posh. And so sometimes that might mean that you have to do an RCT in two different populations. It doesn't mean you come to a, to a full stop and just give up completely. So learning about how to critically appraise the evidence of the claims that are giving you is really important, partly because you don't get to retire at like 50 or 55, especially not in the future. So people who become teachers now, age 25, you'll be working for at least four decades. And over the course of that four decades, <laughs> that was a laugh of like excitement and pleasure and delight and optimism. Oh, I can't wait. Right, 40 years, in 40 years, fads will come and go, practices will come and go, things will change. The claims that people make about what works will change. And I don't think it's enough to just be given a canon of knowledge about what works, given down from authority figures, and then just stick with that. Equally, I don't think it's enough to change your practice over time just from people coming along and giving you another canon, saying this is what we do as authority figures. I think that being able to ask for evidence, being able to appraise that evidence critically is incredibly important. Oh, hello. So next, look, so research, right? Research does come from researchers. Before, like, there, like, there'll, be, uh, there'll be some angry researchers maybe somewhere in the room who will say there should be an arrow connecting the teachers to the researchers. But that all happens over here later. Research gets made. 
And then it just sort of sits there, right? Research is no use if it's published in an academic journal. Research only matters if it gets put into practice, if it gets used by you to change what you do for the good of children and also yourselves, right? That is the only way that research becomes meaningful. And so we need desperately to have clear structures for disseminating the results of research to practitioners, to the foot soldiers, to people at the coalface. And that can take many different forms. Sometimes it can be academic journals, but good grief. I mean, most doctors can barely be bothered to read academic journals. They pile up. Most of the conversation, like everybody's a member of the British Medical Association, gets the British Medical Journal delivered to their door. And the conversation you see the most about this as they pile up in the toilet is, do I have to take the recycling bag, the plastic coating off this, before I put it in the recycling box? Or is it OK to just stick the whole pile in? Right? You need clear summaries of research that are meaningful and relevant to you. Right? You need the three-paragraph summary that says, what did they do? What did they find? What are the strengths and weaknesses of that research? What are the gaps? What needs to be done next to resolve the un outstanding uncertainties about what works best? It can be conferences. And you, know, you can't have conferences that go for days and days and days during the school term. You need conferences that are maybe on a Saturday, and that is annoying. You are like the spods. This is like <laughs> spods among spods. Um, Conferences or inset teaching days or, or anything that gets the results of research into the hands and the minds, but most importantly, the hands, the doing of teachers. And one really sort of interesting way of doing this, which, which is done very commonly in medicine, in other sort of allied healthcare professionals, which is the awful sanctimonious term, which means nurses and occupational therapists and physios and OTs and speech and language therapists and the people who do the real work in hospitals, um, is something called Journal Club. And Journal Club also happens in teaching. In Shanghai and Singapore, you get Journal Club where people come together, and this is a regular meeting, happens maybe on a monthly basis. And at Journal Club, people present one piece of research, just one single piece of research. They don't try and tell you what to do. They don't try and give you an overview of a whole field. They present one single piece of research. They say what they did and what they found in that piece of research, somebody else's research paper. Then they talk about the shortcomings. They talk about the imperfections in the study design, the things that mean that it wasn't perhaps a fair test. They look at whether the, the population of children in that particular piece of research really are the same as the population of children that they see in their own day-to-day -day work. And that act of critically appraising a piece of work, one piece of research, live and in discussion with other people, is incredibly powerful because it gets away from the idea that research is a canon and it keeps the kind of muscles well-tuned and well-toned for spotting flaws, but also, crucially, spotting gaps, because at the end of Journal Club, the one thing that you always do is you go, would I use the results of this piece of research to change my own practice? And if the answer is yes, then you can start to think about, like, how would I implement this finding in my everyday work? And if the answer is no, then you talk about why not. And if you think that there are shortcomings in the study design, and you think that it is trying to answer an important question and you care about the answer, then there's a really important output from, from Journal Club, which is you've spotted a research gap, you've spotted a research need, and because you've got the skills, because you understand how research works, you describe what research needs to be done next to fill that hole. There is a phrase which is banned in the British Medical Journal which is, more research is needed. And it's banned because it is completely asinine. It's completely empty. It tells you nothing at all. If you think more research is needed, then you should specify exactly what is needed. And that is how you generate interesting and meaningful research questions. 
And crucially, you get interesting and meaningful research questions generated by people who are doing the everyday work. Because you need teachers to tell everybody else what it is that needs to be researched. If teachers know best about what the outstanding uncertainties are. Teachers know best about, look, this person's coming to us and they're trying to sell, this, sell us this amazing whiz-bang program, which they say is going to transform the maths department. And you know, they, they, we asked them for evidence and they just sort of looked a bit embarrassed or got angry and defensive. Um, and this is what we think we'd need to do to answer the question of whether or not this intervention actually works or not. Maybe it's a randomized trial, maybe it's an observational study, maybe you want to start with some qualitative stuff, who knows? But teachers can generate research ideas as well as researchers, if not better, as long as they have a clear understanding of how research works. And then lastly, okay. <laughs> So look, uh, this is the teachers up here, that's you, and this is the researchers down here, okay? Now, you remember evidence-based practice teaching, yeah, that was the first bit, you saw that. That's this little thing here, that's what researchers do to you, okay? It's, it's good though, it feels nice. And then this was research, so research gets made by researchers and then given to teachers and teachers' feedback into research. This is Journal Club, right? Journal Club is a way of, of research getting to you and also you feed back into research. But then also, this is research questions here. It was a little picture of a silo. It's really good. It took me ages to find it. I'm really angry that you can't see it, okay? <laughs> this silo, this is a silo of research questions that you have generated by going to Research Club but also by operating cluefully that is the opposite of cluelessly, by operating cluefully in your schools and teaching environments where there are uncertainties that you have spotted. And you have added to this big pile of research questions really usefully. And that big pile of research questions is then there. It's this rich resource that anybody who wants to can come along and go, God, you know, I fancy doing a bit of research today. Are there any outstanding uncertainties in the field of education? Right? And you go, well, yeah, actually, here's this big silo which I spent ages getting and which you can't see. And then lastly, here is a research network, right? 